Pascual Egalo, he's a pediatric neurosurgeon who's based um, in the same center here. Good morning. I'm going to restart it. <laughs> Ms. Jay Shet, are uh, here presenting from Edinburgh. And first and foremost, we would like to thank the organizers for uh, providing this opportunity. We are really honored. Uh, my name is Jay Shetty. I'm a pediatric neurologist based at the Neurosciences Department um, in the Royal Hospital for Sick Children in Edinburgh. I got my colleague with me, uh, Mr. Pasquale Gallo. He's a pediatric neurosurgeon who's based um, in the same center here. Good morning. Um, you must be wondering what's a pediatric neurologist doing in this group. Um, let me briefly explain how we work here. Uh, you can see right on the top there are two children's hospitals. One is our existing Victorian hospital and the one which we will be moving, uh, the new one, soon. Uh, here we work together with pediatric neurologists, pediatric neurosurgeons and the neurophysiology team. This gives us a unique opportunity to work uh, with each other, learn from each other and also this helps uh, provide a better patient care and we are quite proud of this um, working uh, together. Today we're going to talk about the Chiari malformation and syringomyelia and the clinical deterioration which we found despite a good resolution of the syringomyelia. Uh, we presented this paper and we will briefly talk about this and hopefully open up for question later on. As a disclosure, we do not have any um, conflicts of interest related to this topic. As an outline of this talk, we are going to talk a little bit about the case series to start with. Uh, Mr. Gallo will talk a little bit more about the surgical treatment. Uh, we will explain the, the worsening neurological findings which we found in these children. And then we will discuss what we think is probably the potential mechanism and obviously we would want to open this up to this group as you have a huge amount of experience in this area. I do not need to talk much about the syringomyelia or Chiari malformation to this audience and um, you, you know very well the association of uh, Chiari malformation and syringomyelia and other uh, clinical symptoms. I can say from reading literature that the pathophysiology of syringomyelia is not very clear. Uh, we confirm this diagnosis by uh, MRI scan. The treatment options, um, particularly in terms of monitoring and managing clinically asymptomatic um, syringomyelia, is variable. It can be different in different centers, uh, different countries, and even between different surgeons. However, it's a fairly standard practice to treat symptomatic syringomyelia uh, in almost all settings. So what are the treatment? Uh, neurosurgical treatment is the treatment of option, um, only option for this, and the cranial cervical decompression is the surgical uh, procedure performed. Now the method and the surgical techniques are variable between uh, surgeons, centers, and, uh, and countries. The aim of this treatment is to reduce the symptoms, uh, resolve the symptoms, or prevent further deterioration or future complications. Now, like any surgeries, this surgery is not without any complications, and, and the surgical complications of these procedures are well documented. So what is the outcome predicted? As I said before, a resolution of the symptoms or reduction of symptoms or prevent future progression of or other complications is the main aim. In a best case scenario, we would like to have an uneventful surgery, a reduction in syrinx, and complete symptom resolution with no post-operative complications. However, the worst case scenario could be there could be surgical complications and no improvement in symptoms. Here we present three cases where we had good surgical outcome and after some time, these children developed new neurological symptoms despite a good radiological resolution of the syrinx. Let me take you through the cases. The first case is an 11-year-old girl who was referred to us by the scoliosis team. Uh, we are based here in Edinburgh where the National Scoliosis uh, Service is based. She was well before um, the neurosurgical at the time of neurosurgical evaluation in terms of her neurology. Uh, she had normal neurological examination. She went through uh, foreign magnum decompression and expensile watertight duroplasty, which Mr. Gala will talk a little bit more um, in, a, in a minute. 
post operatively she had a aseptic meningitis very briefly uh, which resolved within a week or two and she was discharged home however two months later she complained of pins and needles a pain and numbness in her hands and legs and as a new symptom she had a post operative mri scan at this stage which showed a reduction in sphingomyelia which i will show you the scan in a minute the second case was a 12 year old boy who has had progressive scoliosis again his neurological evaluation at the time of um, assessment in the neurosciences unit was normal he had ki malformation and on his scan showed a hollow cord a sphingomyelia he went through the same procedure and again had no neurological complication however he also complained of numbness and lack of sensation and weakness in his arms and legs and this symptom appeared a year later again his post operative scan showed reduction in sphingomyelia the third case is slightly different this is a this was initially diagnosed as a when she presented with the uh, apnea as in, in infancy at that time she was noted to have carry malformation and a signal change in her cord she, at that stage she went through a formin magnum decompression without a duroplasty she was followed up in our neurosciences unit and she developed some symptoms later on she had um, a reduced sensation in her upper limb and repeat mri scan at this stage showed a uh, sphingomyelia in the region of c2 to t10 she went through an expansive watertight duroplasty again and this time she had no post operative complication however a year later she presented with neurological symptoms particularly in her lower limbs and she also had some bladder symptoms now these are three different cases and now i will hand over to mr gallo who will take us through the surgical procedure as the audience in the neuro in neurosurgical audience would probably want to know are uh, these surgeries are any different mr gallo thank you thanks jay so um, as you all know a broad spectrum of intervention have been recommended for the treatment of carry malformation uh, in our presentation here i uh, specifically refer only to the foramen magnum decompression surgical technique and i won't mention anything regarding other propose surgical procedure for the treatment of carry malformation such as uh, cranial expansion or uh, um, c1 c2 uh, uh, posterior fixation um, let's say that we individualize here the surgical treatment according uh, to the patient and preoperative mri feature features and we describe these in our recent paper Uh, that is mentioned in his slides at the end this slide at the end um the three cases discussed here however uh, they all uh, received a, a dural opening and expansile water tile uh, duroplasty um so um all patient are placed in prone position under general anesthetic a midline skin incision is made from the inion to the upper cervical spine a standard superiostial uh, dissection from the occipital bone to the upper cervical spine is carried out uh, the posterior cervical muscle are elevated to expose the occipital bone the foramen magnum and the posterior arch of c1 and c2 when needed uh, and a limited suboccipital craniectomy and the c1 posterior arch removal are performed in all cases a c2 laminectomy is very rarely uh, required in our experience um, and uh, mostly is an upcut more than a complete uh, laminectomy the posterior atlanto occipital membrane is incised and fully resected from the underlying dura under the microscope in all cases uh, at this stage If the interven if the intention was to perform just a, a bony decompression alone a meticulous hemostasis is achieved and the wound closed in uh, uh, layers um, however as we said all three patient had also the next step of uh, uh, dura opening arachnoidal opening um, ensuring a free egress of cerebral spinal fluid from the fourth ventricle particularly the first and the third patient also had 
a tonsillar shrinkage with bipolar coagulation. And then uh, we performed uh, um, a watertight uh, uh, expansile duroplasty in one patient with the pericranial graft, uh, harvest from the superior part of the incision, and in other two patients using uh, an allograft, particularly um, uh, durapair in one case uh, and duragard in another case. And um, the overlying soft tissue uh, were closed in layers as described uh, in, uh, in the paper. Thank you, Mr. Garo. Um, now, uh, going back to the cases again, um, we will just look at the, the imaging. Now, this is the, the scan uh, of the case one, which I've described. Uh, on your left is the preoperative imaging, where you can easily see the syringomalia. And the second image on your right is the post-operative imaging. This is three months. Uh, post-surgery and you can see the reduction in size of the syringomyelia. Here is a second case where um, you can see again on your left is the uh, preoperative imaging and on the right um, is the post-operative imaging. Um, and, but again you can see a clear uh, difference and shrinkage in the syringomyelia. This is uh, bit more dramatic reduction you can see on the left uh, preoperative um, imaging and on the post uh, operative imaging a year later uh, almost complete uh, resolution of the syringe and um, that unfortunately um, did not resolve or, or and, and she developed new symptoms. However we are describing three case reports and we know where we sit in terms of the, the evidence pyramid we are at the bottom of the evidence pyramid. I guess we, what we want to open up for discussion is that is it common phenomenon or is it just the three cases we have seen and it's that chance alone? I guess that question is not hard to answer and hence we reported these case reports and I'm sure uh, other colleagues will have seen these cases and it's important to collaborate and discuss these cases and if it's a common phenomenon then that leads to further questions and the second question is are these new neurological symptoms temporary or permanent? If you have a large group of children to follow up, it is not hard to answer this question. Over time, we can see whether these neurological features are temporary or permanent. However, I think what's more challenging question is the, what, is the, what is the mechanism for this? Now, I'm a neurologist and I do not go anywhere closer to the operation theater and the anatomy is very well known to Mr. Gallo and I will hand over to him to talk about the mechanism, what exactly he does, and why does he uh, think these symptoms appear? Mr. Gallo. Thanks, Jay. So, um, obviously, I don't know the mechanisms, and that's uh, the reason why we uh, wrote this paper, and uh, we um, very careful follow all the patient operated for carry malformation and syringomelia. Um, these uh, three patients particularly uh, struck my attention because uh, there was a remarkable improvement in the syringomelia uh, with the new appearances, with appearances of new symptoms um, completely uh, that were not present before uh, the operation. And it was very hard to explain this to uh, the parents and the families, as you can uh, all uh, imagine. And I couldn't find much in, uh, in, the, uh, in the literature. So that's what the main reason to uh, write this uh, collaborative paper. Um, so one possible hypothesis, it could be that um, obviously axons uh, uh, and nerve fibers reorganize uh, during the syringomelia formation that I think is an active process, um, is a dynamic uh, uh, process and with an MRI or several MRI we only um, kind of uh, uh, picture a particular moment of the syringomelia natural history and the immediate quick decompression caused by our intervention may alter these dynamics and perhaps uh, uh, cause uh, uh, some sort of uh, subsequent myelopathy. Um, we have evidence also from post-mortem findings uh, that uh, um, during the syringomelia there is a gliosis inside the cavity and uh, so a neurological damage can may simply result uh, from this. Another very interesting hypothesis uh, um, uh, recently proposed by 
uh, Bognaton in uh, Journal uh, Neurology in 2006, um, is uh, a so-called post-syringomyelia uh, syndrome. Um, so this group uh, um, followed up for uh, uh, many years a number um, of over 100, a number uh, of patients um, with the Chiari and syringomyelia not operated, and they observed that in the vast majority of cases the syringomyelia was spontaneously uh, resolving, however, uh, leaving this patient with serious uh, um, um, myelopathic uh, um, syndromes. Uh, this could be also another possible um, explanation and brings us to the second question, which uh, for a neurosurgeon and also for a pediatrician and for a, for a neurology uh, is very important in my opinion. Is there a right timing to perform the surgery? And when is this right timing? And which patient could really benefit from uh, surgery? Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gallo. So I guess to um, come to a, a conclusion or wrap up the session is that what are the take home messages? And I guess first and foremost, it is very important um, to counsel young people and family um, regarding these symptoms in spite of uh, surgical success, there may be possibility of these symptoms. And that's, that's very important that we need to inform young people and family. And as Mr. Gallo touched upon, um, the right patient for right surgery at the right time is quite crucial. Uh, as a child neurologist, it is my duty when I see patients uh, and we might do a scan for some other reason and we diagnose um, uh, syringomyelia or carry malformation based on the scan. And it's important that we discuss with the neurosurgical colleagues very early on. Equally, it's quite important for uh, making sure that the, the, the wrong patient doesn't go for surgery and which we discuss within our department all the time. However, I think it's also important that we need to think further if this is um, a common um, finding, then what could be the mechanism so that we could think about potential solutions? Could we use neurophysiology or other monitoring uh, during the surgery which can give us a bit more clue or um, depending on different cases we might um, think about other biomarkers uh, or other uh, clinical findings which may be uh, which might give a better idea so I think we need to think about the mechanism a bit more so we would like to thank our other um, uh, colleagues who are part of this paper and also uh, colleagues within the neurosciences department here and particularly the neurophysiology colleagues and uh, we would like to thank you for giving us this opportunity and for your attention today and we will open up uh, this uh, for a discussion and questions particularly we are keen to hear if anyone else had any other exp similar experience uh, as well. Uh, we are sorry we couldn't join you in uh, San Diego but um, I would we would like to welcome you to Scotland which is a beautiful country and we are here in Edinburgh on a sunny um, Saturday um, uh, we hope you enjoy your uh, conference and have a wonderful day. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you.